So if we, if I ask myself, if I ask myself, uh, what is statistics, and actually go to Wikipedia to find the answer, the answer on Wikipedia, and this is not from any fancy um, fancy place, just Wikipedia, is that the statistics is the science of collection, organization, displaying analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. Okay. Now this sounds nothing very different from data science. Right? because it is the science of data. As these, these bullet points indicate, it is nothing but the science of data. So why are statistics and data science different from each other? Right? What makes these two things different from each other? Well, this is the traditional definition of statistics. Now, this definition of statistics came about before the advent of computers, right? before, the, the, before internet, before computers came into being. And so if we look at modern day data and modern day statistics, in blue, I am representing all the areas that statistics interacts with due to modern data, okay? So for example, if I think of collecting data, a lot of data that is collected is collected on our phones, right? Or when we browse the computer, when we browse the internet, there is data being collected and that data um, of how we are behaving with the world online uh, is being stored and gathered using computer science tools, using data structures, using uh, scrapers, using network science, etc. So if we are thinking of statistics and collecting data, then we cannot in the modern world do it in isolation without learning about computer science. Right? How do you organize data? Now, if I spend five minutes on my phone, which I do often, I will be generating so many data points. Everywhere that my finger moves on the screen is going to be tracked by my phone, right? So that creates a lot of data that is being collected. That means that needs to be put in an organized framework, right? Somewhere for it to be analyzed in the future. That analysis and storing in some big server place requires again computer science knowledge. Now that I've collected data and organized it and saved it properly, somehow I need to be able to represent it and plot it and visualize it and look at it. Right? That means I need a methodology that can take massive data sets and make pie charts, make histograms, make curves, make line charts, right? or make really pretty or really interesting or charts that are OK for colorblind people. right? In these type of analyses, I will again need computer science infrastructure because I need to handle large data. And I will need the arts. I will need to understand what colors are good colors, what colors are bad colors, what shapes are good. How can we give more information in that same, uh, in that same visual, right? Finally, we will actually get down to actually analyzing our data, and that requires statistics knowledge, but also in modern day operations, modern day tools, it requires machine learning knowledge. Right? So that is interacting with machine learning. And then I need to interpret the data. If I've gotten the data from, let's say, COVID analysis, then I need to talk to an epidemiologist to make sure I can, I know an understanding of how my results in mathematics world translate into the real application, right? If I'm thinking about sports data, I need to talk to a sports coach to explain what my actual numbers mean for that actual sport, right? So I need application knowledge, the knowledge about that application. And then I need to be able to present it, right? I need to develop software that, that projects data. I need to be able to understand what is needed in that presentation. And the amalgamation of all of these for modern day problems which are really, really complex and built in the world of computers requires a building of data science, okay? And that's why data science is not the same as statistics completely. It has a lot of the same characteristics, but it is different in the modern day present world, all right? So what is data science? This is, this is a very popular uh, graph that I, if, you, if I have data science students in the audience, then I'm sure they've already seen some of it. Uh, so this is Drew Conway's popular Venn diagram, which you know, hopefully all of us know how to read a Venn diagram. These are three circles. There's a computer science circle here, a math and stats circle, and a domain knowledge or application or business knowledge circle. 
Now, when math and computer science intersect, then they intersect in order to display, or oh, sorry, in order to construct the analysis or interpretations or models and methodologies, and that's machine learning. Right? When computer science and domain knowledge intersect, that's software development, developing software for some application. When math and statistics uh, battle with uh, domain knowledge, that could be traditional research. So mathematical models for physical systems, for example. But when you combine all of these together, computer science, math, and application, math and stat and application, in the intersection, any problem space that requires all three of them interacting requires data science, is data science, right? This is one definition, right? One interpretation of data science. And this is the one that speaks the most to me. And this is the one that I, I keep uh, myself reminded of. Right? So, so what I'm going to focus a lot on are typical examples of research in data science, right? What are the research problems in data science that people are interested in? And this would, you know, hopefully help the students actually understand what kind of problems they can pick up in their final projects and so on. Okay. Um, I will also discuss skills required for these problems, and I'm, I'm going to do this through a variety of examples. All right. Now, uh, I will request at this point, the next slide, I'm going to ask questions uh, and, and fr from the next slide. So please make sure you've warmed up your fingers to type the answers. Okay? So my first example, sorry, one second. My first example is that of a food recommendation system. All right. Now I have food in the bracket, but I'm, it's basically called a recommendation system. So the idea is that there's a program I want to build that will recommend me foods based on what I like and dislike. Okay. So now for, in order to do that, in order for a system to recommend food to me, right, I need to train that system. Okay. Let's say we hire a chef or a cook in our house, right? In the beginning, the cook will ask us, Didi, to, to me, the, the, the cook will ask us, Didi, what do you eat? What do you like to eat, right? Kya pasand hai? What do you like to eat? And so I will tell the cook, you know, these are the things I like to eat. And from that, you know, he or she will adapt, right? They will adapt uh, based on uh, what I tell them, what I like or not. That is a human learning from my likes and dislikes. And I want a computer now to learn from my likes and dislikes. I hope a computer can also make food for me, but sadly that can't happen. Okay, so let's say I look at this. Now, this is a slice of pizza. It's a delicious looking pizza. Now, what are certain, now I need to tell the computer whether I like this or not. Now, I am a human being, so I like pizza, right? As all human beings should like pizza. Now, what are, now the computer will think, or it has notes inside of its head that, that uh, understands what are the attributes or features or characteristics of pizza. So now I'll ask you, what are the important characteristics, characteristics of pizza that make it delicious for us? Right, so this is your opportunity to please type in your answers. What are the characteristics of a typical slice of pizza that make it interesting or delicious to the eater? Nobody likes pizza or people are slow typers. That's OK if you're a slow typer. Everybody knows where the chat box is. Cheese burst. OK, for one really enthusiastic cheese eater. Um, cheese burst on top. Yes, exactly. There is a beautiful layer of cheese on the top. And you know that makes, uh, that makes the eating experience of pizza really, really enjoyable. What else is in pizza that we like? Variety of toppings, exactly. You can you can mix and match. You can put whatever you want, right? Uh, if you're one of those people who like pineapple on pizza, great. You have you like pineapple on pizza, you can do that. You can put achar on pizza. It's all good, you know. Whatever you want to put on pizza, you can put oregano, chili flakes, capsicum. Okay, now that now now the things are coming in. It can be spicy. It can be sweet. It can be you know. Uh, but inherently to the pizza, one thing a lot of humans like is bread. Any kind of bread is interesting. Exactly, crust. We eat rotis in India, right? We, there is bread eaten in the West, and the pizza is really delicious because of the bread as well. So you've got bread, cheese, variety of toppings. And one thing that I haven't seen yet is the tomatoes. A tomato is often integral to the pizza, and it is the 
sourness slight tartness slight sourness of the of the tomatoes that goes really well with the exactly the sauce goes really well with the cheese now i'm very hungry at this point right so these are the things that are the characteristics so the computer has these tags you know in there that somebody is fed when we are training the system we'll associate tags to you know the fact that it's italian the fact that there is cheese the fact that there is sauce the fact that it has bread right excellent and the tags associated are exactly you know cheese tomato italian bread and it's baked it's baked it's a baked product so maybe the way you make it is also important okay now once i tell now it has these tags in its memory and once i tell the computer bhai i like pizza right now it knows that if i like pizza i probably like anything that has cheese tomatoes italian bread or baked right a simple thing for it to do is to like all of these is to assume i like all of these things right so it will assume i will like all of these things this is one way a recommendation system can work so now it will go ahead and predict that i will like this right does anybody know what the what this is this is a this is a okay it's a type of bread but it's called a croissant right perfect it's called a croissant it is also baked right also baked also made of bread so it it got two things perfect it is also somewhat italian so it got three things correct okay anything else that i'm missing anyone uh, anyone who knows croissants a bit bit better okay here is a task for everyone to do after this talk please look at yeah it can be flavored as well it can be chocolate croissants in there there could be some you would have chicken croissants if you want um please go ahead and look at a video of croissant making you will realize how much enormous amounts of butter go into the making of a croissant enormous amounts of butter so the computer may think bhai i like cheese so i like dairy so maybe i like bread right and there is dough exactly there is dough as well right so there is so it will suggest a croissant to me if i like pizza and for my case i love croissants uh and so there is butter it is sort of italian it is uh, it has bread and it is baked right so in this case the recommendation would be perfect right now the computer gives me another recommendation based so i tell it yes i like yes this was great remember when netflix asks you whether you like or dislike the movie right that's what it's asking it's asking for feedback right now what are these what are these lovely little things donuts yeah this was the fastest from everyone huh? everyone likes donuts now the computer is like i know you dutika i know you inside and out you like donuts right perfect yeah everybody yeah excellent so it says donuts now it's not wrong it's certainly found in italy it has bread it is fried and baked when you make donuts you make fried and baked right it has cream which is made of cheese right which is made of dairy as in right um it has lot of lot of perfect things yeah uh and you can just just like a pizza you can make it in different flavors and different toppings in the same way right so it thinks i like donuts but it is wrong right i hate donuts personally i hate donuts because i don't like anything sweet i can't eat anything sweet you give me ice cream you give me mithai i don't like it that's okay it's going to guess based on the fact that bread baked fried and sweet these are the characteristic it has but now that i tell it that no thumbs down i don't like it it knows i like bread i like baked and maybe i like fried it knows that i probably don't like sweet right because there is no other reason for me to dislike donuts correct and so this is how the computer is going to build information as to what it wants to recommend to me just like my didi does my cook does okay and so now based on this it concludes that because i don't like sweets i am crazy i am a maniac and so it suggests this to me right now what are the characteristics of this food this is uh, what is this what, what do you think you see over here it's a bad picture something green spinach yes palak yes correct it is spinach and there are there is also garlic over here in the middle this is a sort of lightly fried garlic there is a little bit of oil um oil salt garlic and spinach that's it for yeah exactly perfect gayatri is a cook clearly palak with only salt that's exactly right 
it is now the now what it has as pointers as tags for this food is healthy vegetable maybe spinach nutritional low calories and i actually love spinach and garlic in little bit of salt and onion uh, salt and oil it's absolutely delicious right so now it's starting to know that i'm a crazy person i don't like sweet i don't like sweets and i don't like all of these uh, uh things right so again this is the way you might one the you might train a computer to just pick up on keywords as long as every food product has keywords attached to it right the better and more detailed the keywords you know the better the food recommendation system will be now of course what i'm telling you is just this seems like a regular discussion but you can mathematically code it right you can have let's say zeros and ones be associated with whether i like something healthy or whether i like some vegetables or do whether i like bread or not and just keep a track of how many ones have been accumulated and produce the best match from the number of ones that i have to the objects in your bin that are food available in the world right okay so in this way we train of a recommendation system algorithm now there are recommendation systems present all over the world all around us all the time netflix i already mentioned in 2006 netflix announced a 1 us dollar million prize for any group that improved their recommendation system uh, method and it was won by a group at berkeley i think at that time which is a university in the us uh, in 2006 by the way because i'm sure all of you students are very young uh, netflix did exist uh, phones existed computers existed Netflix did exist but it did not exist like we know it it was not a streaming platform it was only in the US and it was a way uh, the way Netflix worked is you could go on the website and choose which movies you wanted and they will mail you a cd of the movie and then you will watch the movie and then email uh, sorry mail mail meaning post mail post mail the cd back and that's how Netflix worked in those times on amazon as well amazon flipkart and all of these websites you know there are ratings and it suggests uh recommendations to you, you may, if you bought this you may like this right it's trying to get you to buy other things that you may like right and particularly for researchers like me um google scholar is a place where there are a lot of there you can search for papers so if you're looking for papers on different topics on google scholar you can search and if you have a profile on google scholar that uh, tracks the num the papers that you have written and cited it will recommend papers for you to read right that this paper you you may like to read so that it has its own recommendation system okay now where do recommendation systems land in this intersection right so before before uh, because a lot of the recommendation system methods used to be online right it it mainly pre presented itself mainly in computer science but now as just a theoretical concept because there wasn't a lot of real life application that computers were actually implementing i'm saying in the 80s and 90s right and now that computers have gone into the sphere it's moved it's using more and more math and statistics and actually coming into the application base as well as well you can understand that food recommendation systems can be different from paper recommendation systems so the application of interest needs to be taken into account when the recommendation systems are being built right and what does research in this look like so for example if i on amazon or netflix say that no i didn't like this or yes i liked it it needs to reupdate those recommendations immediately for me and give me a new set of recommendations right that is happening at immediate time right it has to happen immediately from its long list of movies that i like or that are on there it needs to very quickly tell me what movies uh, are good for me or not right so it needs to be really quick and that's a uh, that from a computer science perspective that's a big area of research it we need to understand if i'm coming up with a new recommendation system theoretically is it going to improve on the old recommendation systems as in can it better guess the tendency of a user or will it not and so how do you study these the quality of a recommendation system theoretically that's a big area of research okay? and obviously as you would have understood we'd like to come up with new recommendation systems and this is the most exciting for somebody starting in this area is okay how do i come up with a recommendation system in a new area or improve on a recommendation system that may not be very good 
right for example i personally don't like uh, netflix's recommendation system but imdb which is a website for uh, movies has a great recommendation system that works really well for me okay. all right any questions with recommendation systems i'm done with the first example i'll move on to the next example if you have a question you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask me all right well i'm open to questions towards the end as well if i'm sure we'll have time um, okay uh, which algorithm is main, is mainly in used in this in the food recommendation system world uh, the, so there are lots of recommendation systems that are actually in use um, i cannot tell you which algorithm mainly because there is no name particular uh, given to it they, i if, for me to uh, tell you the algorithm it will require me explaining the whole algorithm and it can be mathematically quite intense um, and involved and so that's not something we can necessarily go over uh, but if you go on google scholar for example and uh, and search netflix or even on just regular google search netflix million dollar prize you will get to the actual paper that was written from that recommendation system right so just search netflix million dollar prize and you'll find the paper that that resulted in the recommendations okay this is another example um this example is uh, is talking about a very very different example it's from agriculture okay um so the the, the what what the goal in this study was that there was a group a department of agronomy or agriculture at minnesota where i did my phd had a bunch of data where they took a spectrometer which is a device that measures spectral radiation from crops okay so you take this machine and you go over this piece of land which has some crop maybe rice or wheat or something and you just hover this machine over that small piece of land okay what it does is it sends um, sends wavelengths to back to the crop to the crop and then measures its reflectance back okay for different wavelengths okay how much light you can think of this as light how much light is reflected back when this machine uh, puts light on the crop and the goal was to identify which wavelengths separate the different varieties of barley so there is a big crop of land that has different kinds of barley right different varieties species of barley which is a crop and the goal was to see that if there is a certain wavelength that this machine uh, machine pulls puts down that can separate and identify that at if on this wavelength the reflectance is 20 then that means this is the uh, barley 5 variety versus the barley 10 variety Right. So, can I identify the variety of barley from these readings? Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, like I said, this is the spectral reflectance measurements were taken on barley leaf canopies using a spectrometer. So, these are small, small uh, plots of land are called canopies. And then, before certain groups of measurement, the instrument was calibrated to a white reference, uh, reference. meaning perfect reflectance so this machine was taken to a white sheet of paper and said okay how much is reflecting back because it's a white sheet of paper it reflected everything so it's perfect reflectance and a completely dark sheet of paper for no reflectance so just so it knows what is the most reflectance and what is the least amount of reflectance okay and they were reading from 2048 different wavelengths from 340 nanometers to 1020 nanometers okay so just to let you know if you're dealing with data science this means that you can't just have a knowledge of mathematics and statistics or computer science we will need to learn something about you know these spectroscopy machines we will have to go into the application knowledge and learn something about that application knowledge right so here in this example i as a student working on this problem had to go learn about the spectrometer i i didn't know anything about it at that time so the value measured by this machine was the observed reflectance minus the dark reflectance dark reflectance was used for calibration and this in the denominator was the total possible reflectance right perfect reflectance minus dark reflectance was the total possible reflectance okay 
And so this is measured. And in this very scary spreadsheet was the overall reflectance measures measured. Over here, we had all the nanometers. So this keeps going down from 300 to above 1000. And in each column is the different plot of land. Okay. And data was collected on different dates as well. So this is date one. And I don't, I haven't been able to show you another date. And over here, this is the different variety codes of barley, right? Of different kinds of codes. So what we did first was that, okay, we, we said, let's just plot as a function of the nanometers, as a function of wavelength for each uh, variety of barley, what was the reflectance on the y-axis, okay? So on the x-axis, the nanometer, the wavelength, and then the y-axis, the, um, the uh, reflectance. And then we'll do it for all varieties and all plots of land that were scanned, okay? This is what we got. So wavelength on the x-axis, reflectance on the y-axis, every different color is a different plot of land that was scanned, okay? Now our goal is to find a wavelength on the x-axis, okay? So that if we were to draw, or let me see if I can annotate. If we were to, um, don't think I can annotate. If we were to draw a, oops, if we were to, sorry, if we were to draw a vertical line on anywhere on this x-axis, can we figure out which of those vertical lines will help us pick out a wave, a, a, a species of barley from another, okay? Now, each color corresponds to a species. So for example, we see a black here, and that same species comes here, 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 wherever there is black. We see pink here, and that same species corresponds to all of where is pink, right? And here as well, right? So what's happening is everywhere we see for any given color, it is it can be found anywhere, okay? If it can be found anywhere, that I, then I know that there is no wavelength that can potentially separate right, the different varieties of barley, because every color is found everywhere, okay? So if I look, for example, at particularly at Karl, Karl is a particular kind of barley, okay? And again, make that same plot only for the four measurements of Karl that were taken. The measurements of Karl taken was on day one at 1.30 p.m., day one, 2.30 p.m., day two, 9.15, 14 a.m., and day two, 10 a.m. Okay. Now I see that for that same variety of barley, right, I am seeing such drastic measurements from lift reflectance, right? And this and variety of barley should have roughly the same reflectance. And the same is seen for lacy. And now you see the squiggly pattern that is happening in green for day two, data collected on day two is also happening for lacy. So can somebody guess what is happening here? The same, these are different varieties of barley, but the same green pattern is being observed here. The same squiggly up and down pattern. Any, any guesses? No? So what is happening here is that reflectance is being measured blue. So, okay, one question is blue and red are merged. Blue and red are merged, not so much, right? Because blue is here, red is here. So they're fairly separated, right? Um, maybe you're talking a little bit here, but all the ones are uh, merged pretty much here. All of them are squished together pretty much here. So maybe that, that's not quite as right. But what we are seeing, the reason we are seeing this green up and down shape is that we, uh, the, when I was working on this project, I went to the date on day two and I saw that it was a cloudy day. It was a very cloudy day, okay? And what happened is that the sun, the clouds are moving over and above the sun the whole time, okay? And so if I'm trying to measure reflectance, then the amount of sunlight at my disposal needs to remain constant, right? 
And so if I am constructing the experiment of collecting this data, I need to control for all of these things, right? I need to make sure I'm doing it at the same time when the sun is at the same angle on days when it is clear sky so that there is no variability, right? And measure and keeping an account of all of these things. And all of these variations were happening because of the amount of sun and the difference in the daytime. One, one thing is at 1.30 p.m. where the sun is slightly off center, then 2.20 a little bit more off center. Then in the mornings it is this way, sun is more towards the east, right? And so the direction is also changing, the strength is also changing. And so the, what we went back is we noticed that if I plot the, the in orange are day one measurements and in blue are day two measurements, I notice that they these are all quite separated from each other. Right? They don't intermix. And it is because day one was cloudier than day two, for example, or it could have been the other way around, but there are different levels of sun exposure and different times. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that the collection of data was not designed properly, keeping in mind the effects of the time, date, weather, plot of land, etc. And in, the, in statistics, actually the collection of data, remember the first point in statistics was collection of data. The collection of data is crucial, right? If we are designing an experiment, we need to make sure we factor in all the different things that can affect the experiment, right? And this whole area is called design of experiments. And in fact, the speaker on January 7th, uh, Dr. Satya Singh works in, in this area as well, right? So research in this area answers the following question. How do we minimize noise in the data, right? If I go back to this for car, for this variety of barley, I should see the same measurement you know, at wavelength 800. I shouldn't see these four different measurements, right? So I want to design the experiment in such a way that this very, oops, that this variation at 800 is small right and at 550 this variation is small i want to design the experiment in such a way right how do i do that that's what a research question in this is how to account for and estimate the noise right no matter how well i design the experiment there will be some factors that will still affect right my my data collection process so there will be still some noise so how can I build the experiment so that I can account for that noise? So instead of collecting the data on only two day, different days, I should have collected the data on 30 different days so that at least I have lots of data and I can average over those lots of data. Right? And then finally, how to account for these large number of factors affecting the observation. So because I didn't measure Right? Because I did not measure the, the temperature and the cloudiness on those days, I had no way of accounting for them later on in my study because these things were not measured. So unless I measure something, I cannot account for it later on. So then this means that how to account for things later on, I need to be able to measure it. Right? So these are all questions that are asked in design of experiments. Now, design of experiments used to be a very traditional applied statistics area. It used to be in mathematics and statistics and domain, right? So agriculture had a big design of experiments um, uh, application, and then clinical trials are a big design of experiments, um, for example. Now with data science, it has moved, uh, with more computers available, it has moved into sophisticated designs that can be dealt with more complex problems, and that has moved into the data science world, okay? I will talk about my third problem now, which is a navigation problem, completely different. So these are completely distinct examples, okay? So here's a question, okay? I, I believe I have this correct. This is St. Anne's Women uh, uh, College for Women, right? And I want to go, I, let's say I'm visiting, uh, visiting your college and I'm at St. Anne's and obviously I want, if I'm Hyderabad for the first time, I want to go and see Chadminar, right? So I want to see how can I go from St. Anne's uh, College for Women to Chadminar, right? Google uncle tells me that this is the direction, okay? And this is not obviously live. I took it earlier this afternoon. Now it tells me three possible routes. It tells me this route, 
then it tells me this route right through a uh, masab tank and then tells me this route through uh, the north of muradnagar right these are the three different route it tells me now obviously i am doing this only once but let's say some of you are great fans of charminar and want to go every day okay from the college to charminar that's where you hang out and do all your masti mazak right you want to do this every day so now obviously you want to maybe your hostel has a curfew time or something and you have to come back in time right so you want to know what is the best fastest way to go from your college to charminar now google tells you three different things right it may also change the thing based on the time of day right so abhi it says 20 minutes but this is only 31 minutes maybe in the evening this is much better than this one so you have to figure out which of the three possible routes should you take this is a navigation problem so what do you do this is your goal which of the three routes is better what you do is you say okay every time i go every time we leave college the group of us we will choose a different route every time and we will update our information on the quality of that route until we can eliminate all but one route okay there are three routes every time i randomly choose one route okay and some information i gather are either a lot of traffic here lot of red lights here lot of unexpected accidents here right lot of uh, rowdy crowds here this maybe route is unsafe this is safe i track all of this information right and i educate you educate yourself okay and with that information then you finally say okay i have eliminated some other routes and i will choose only one route the last route that remains is the best route this system is called the multi armed bandit system or the multi armed bandit problem okay the way the multi armed bandit problem actually works is the following in the first question it will go let's say you're actually trying to implement sorry you're actually trying to implement this multi armed bandit problem so you say after testing each route let's say you've tested each route once okay right? and you say okay very good should i continue now taking the best route of the three routes you tested okay one of them turned out to be the best route okay because it was least time you say okay i will just go ahead and take this route because this is the best route is this the correct strategy you have three routes one of them turned out to be the best route and you say that maybe you should just take keep taking this best route is that the correct strategy if not why if you want you can unmute yourself or you can answer uh, via typing no it depends on the various parameters right not necessary always exactly it depends on the various parameters I mean, what time did you go what are the things happening like time and traffic yeah, exactly and so you go nahi bhai i have not been able to explore the other routes exhaustively right i need to make sure to conclude that this is the best route i need to make sure the other two routes i have traveled enough time to say ye bakwas hai this is horrible right okay so now let's say in order to explore you say should we keep randomly choosing between the three routes irrespective of the knowledge of the best route so far we we will keep choosing these through randomly even if one of them takes five times the more amount of time right no right since we want to exploit knowledge of the current best route also right sometimes we know that abhi tak so far this route is the best route the other ones are close competition but this is the best route so i want to favor this route more often but still not completely eliminate these two routes right so i want to exploit this is an exploration and exploitation balance that we want to maintain what is working well for us we want to exploit what we don't have enough knowledge about we want to explore right and we want to balance these two things this is the this is a navigation problem however this is omnipresent in our world all of you have birthdays some treats you ask for you for your friends and every time you have to decide which restaurant to go to right for a birthday or where to or now with your generation is ordering from zomato only right you have to understand where to go where to order from exploitation means that you will keep going to your favorite restaurant no matter what happens right 
but then what about this new irani cafe place that has opened up you've never you'll never going to try food there right you can you're not going to explore explore the more options that are available but then you also don't want to every day try new restaurants because you know it's it's a balance game you're signing up for failure often if you try new restaurants because most restaurants are not that great right and you know ki one restaurant is very nice you know it so you do should you take that or should you explore more and you and all of us know that some days we we say that no no i want to try something new today right that we are playing the exploration exploitation game in our mind okay similarly online ads so companies do this all the time right so let's say you're on facebook or i don't know i don't know instagram or one of these apps um you know they show ads to the user all the time right now the way they're showing ads actually is they're doing an exploration exploitation trade off they are deciding should i show to this person should i show the ad that has worked the most with our users or should i show the ad that i have not explored as much and may turn out to be the most the best ad to show right and so it is actually playing this game that should i keep showing the ad that has created, uh, given the most success or should i show an ad for something that um, that i haven't shown an ad enough for maybe it will turn out great right this also for companies like amazon and google and meta facebook is a exploration exploitation problem oil drilling right there is a there is a location where we know there is a lot of oil right now if i keep taking oil from that area i may not be utilizing other possible locations where there is an avenue for excess oil so there is actually exploration exploitation this multi arm bandit problem that oil drilling companies often employ in their work how much do you want to allocate to new drilling places money and how much money do you want to allocate to exploit the current location and clinical trials as well right so if there is a new drug a new medicine being tested for some new disease a doctor may pres prescribe the now there are three contending uh, uh, medicines that we don't know which one works best none of them have bad effects okay but three of them we don't know which one is best so a doctor may prescribe the drug that may have best done best so far or may uh, prescribe the uh, two drugs that may have not have done better so far because they have not been explored enough okay right? that actually it doesn't happen as much in real life but there are some clinical trials where this is actually happening in the us for example i am sure you can think of much other much more other exploration exploitation problem this used to be a uh, pretty much a computer science and domain specific uh, area that was just do, done with software development but when people started asking the question what probability should i have to explore and exploit with probability half should i explore with probability half should i exploit or should that be different from 0.5 0.5 now this tends to be a mathematical question right and so then mathematics starts coming in statistics start coming in and so this comes into the data science framework right and this multi arm bandits that i have described are a special type of reinforcement learning algorithm okay so this is a whole area called reinforcement learning so the question of research is what with what probability should we explore and exploit when can we stop the process and declare the best route and say okay this is the best route when do we stop how much exploration how much exploitation and what if i have other information like time of uh, time of the day number of accidents and everything else how can i utilize those informations in my exploration exploitation process right that's a very very rich feature of this whole area called reinforcement learning okay um i think i'm going a little slow so i'm going to uh, i'm going to not show this very lovely example with a lev very lovely uh, cake uh, because i think it it will take more time to actually go through this one but just to uh, just to indicate where other examples like this come from i mean i could have chosen any different set of examples because they're abundantly available right so for example if you go into a medical unit and if you are going in for a brain imaging using mri machines or Uh, something called dti machines right 
there are enormous amount of data that is being collected on how your brain is moving or things of particles in your brain are moving that data is analyzed to understand disease for example currently there is a rich area on how to cure alzheimers and where does alzheimers come from and that's being done through various brain imaging, imaging machines let's say your college must have a library right or osmania university certainly will have a very central library and that library has articles and books coming in every day now if it's a massive library and there are tens and thousands of articles and books coming in every day the library needs an automatic system so that it can understand that this is a paper or a book or a document in statistics in mathematics in data science in sports in neuroimaging in what by just reading some parts of that automatically a machine should be able to allocate different sections so that a person doesn't need to do it um that much right or literally a robot computer which for example the ibm watson uh okay i'm just finishing up if i'm running late i'm just finishing up um this ibm watson uh, computer uh was uh, uh took part in a game show called the jeopardy game show and actually won against its contenders and this is just a computer just a question and answer game show and it uh, completely won it was able to understand basic sentences basic um uh things in the game show to be able to win that right um i think that is about it but if you want to learn more interesting things and uh, and decide you know what side of pro what type of problems to pick up on where you can learn more about these case studies for example is a journal called the harvard uh, harvard data science review and that has uh, papers and works that are that solve real problems using mathematics statistics and computer science they describe the problem and they describe their solutions as well right so this would be a a place where you can find not not very easy articles slightly competitive so that you can sort of take the whole semester to understand one of these papers if you like what it's about the skills that you need are mathematics statistics database management or a general idea of how computers work i have never had a course in computer science but i code for a living right uh, so you don't need to have a degree in computer science to be able to be apt and uh, do uh, things appropriately on the computer and coding in c++ or c r python julia java maybe uh, some of these are going to be really really helpful all right I don't need to tell the students this, but there are tons of online courses as well. And if you're interested to study more, I would highly encourage you to do your masters and your PhDs in statistics, computer science, data science. Um, I'm in statistics, so I always encourage people to do a graduate degree in statistics because I think it's the best. But um, in mathematics, applied mathematics, statistics, CS, and data science, all of these areas, um, a graduate degree can also help. I think that is it. Um, there is a question. Uh, what is the roadmap of data science as a fresher? What's the first step in data science? As a, as a fresher, the first step in data science is understanding math and statistics in my book. Because understanding, so there are actually three, understanding math and statistics, being able to code, not being afraid of any coding, the language does not matter. Being able to understand the logic of coding, that's it. Just understand the logic of coding. And third, a general curiosity. As a data scientist, you can't say I'm not interested in finance. I'm only interested in biology. You're a data scientist. That means you're interested in the problems where data arises. So you should be able to be generally curious about the, the questions arising from data in all of these fields. Right? And so the general curiosity is very, very going to be very, very useful in actually being a data scientist, as well as coding and having a good grasp of mathematics and statistics. All right. Uh, if I don't have more time for questions, I apologize, but hopefully I do. Um, you can feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and ask as well. Can you recommend any projects for us, especially those with real time uh, problem solutions? Um, can we, I, I, I like this question and I also dislike this question because this question demonstrates that you are inquisitive and curious and willing to work 
but also demonstrates that you are slightly unwilling to work because you want me to give you a problem right the real interesting thing is you need to identify an area that you like choose whatever thing you like outside of uh, your courses it could be sports movies music cinema books um, covid you know, nobody likes covid but um, you know disease or or something that is of interest to you that you're passionate about and pick up a data problem in that area because if you don't have, as a as a young student trying to learn about these things if you don't have an interest in the problem statement you will not have interest right so if you want an application oriented problem i will encourage you to find an area you're really passionate about maybe it's cooking maybe it's something else right maybe it's sports i love sports and so i will do anything to study data problems in sports right similarly find what you're really passionate about and say let me see if i can solve data problems in this area i so i did not mean to offend you i have already been searching ma'am but not able to stick to a specific area maybe i need to research more so not sticking to a specific area is simple just be um, what's the word in hindi we say ziddi just be stubborn right and say no this area i like this is what i'm sticking to if you open yourself see there are at your stage you have, there are 95000 things that you'd be interested in right that doesn't mean you keep jumping from a to b to z to z right you like one you stick with one one of my favorite things that was ever told to me it is more important to finish a project than to do it very well right okay and it may it may disagree with a lot of what everyone says but really finishing a project making sure you really just finish it that's the first priority then the second priority is that okay now that i think i can finish it when we try to do a good job okay because finishing a task is something that most people are not able to do all right so really first priority is take something that you know you can finish ki ye full i can do then say okay now i now that i'm going to do it fully let me see how where, how i can make it a good thing right so just just if you having problem sticking with it my solution is stick with it okay you're welcome i think we are done with the questions ma'am thank you so much your uh, your thank session you. was very very you know lively and very interesting i'm i'm glad hopefully uh, we are all hopefully it was useful yes ma'am we are all mathematicians but you know <laughs> we are so much connected you know to to your lecture today that you know i i feel you know i have missed learning data science as a student oh that's uh you know what there's still time <laughs> um <laughs> yeah i i will say just to all the students i did put my email address on there and i have unfortunately unfortunately a unique name so if you google me you'll find my email address uh so if you do have questions i i always reply to emails i always always do okay so if you do have a question if you want to resource i'm happy to reply to you I think can we are we done. Stay in with touch with you. Answer. Yeah, ma'am. Can we stay in touch with you through emails? Yeah, sure. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. This has been fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think today's session was really an hour of learning. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your valuable knowledge and giving us deep insights in data science. your explanation was very clear on how mathematics statistics and computer science intersects in data science i profoundly believe that our students are inspired by your highly sparkling lecture and enlightening and interactive session highlighting research problems on recommendation systems barley spectroscopy data earth nav navigation problem research in multi armed bandits and uh, topics like data collection design of experiments exploit and explore balancing and the skills required for that on behalf of department of mathematics i thank you once again for gracing this occasion thank you so much ma'am thank you so much for having me thank you ma'am now coming to the last session i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose vote of thanks on this prestigious occasion gratitude is not only the greatest virtue but the parent of all the virtues let me first of all start by giving glory to the almighty 
for making a national level lecture series on igniting young minds towards research a resounding success. First and foremost, I thank speaker of the first session, Dr. A. Sairam Kaliraj, for sharing his valuable talk on applications of linear algebra in real world problems, which was a power packed session. Halt felt gratitude to Dr. Subhash Martha for enlightening us with his stimulating speech on applications of differential equations and numerical methods. My generous thanks to Dr. Satya Prakash Singh for his sparkling and encouraging talk on linear regressions for data science. My proficient sense of gratefulness to Dr. Tapas Chatterjee for sharing his valuable knowledge on arts of research and I'm sure has laid a foundation in young minds for their further studies. From the depth of our hearts, we thank Dr. Jitendra Kumar for connecting applications of mathematics with science and engineering. Deep sense of gratitude to Dr. Vikas Vikram Singh for enlightening our students on optimization theory and its application. I also would like to acknowledge our gratitude to Dr. Dutika Vats for exposing our students on the applications of statistics, mathematics, and data science. I place on record my heart with gratitude to our sister principal, Dr. Sister Amrita, for her steward's support and encouragement for being a backbone in the conduction of this lecture series. I owe special gratitude to Dr. Smita Asthana, Dean Academics, for her vision and guidance. Next, I would like to thank the torch bearer of this event, Dr. Nirmala Xavier, Head Department of Mathematics and Dean Student Affairs, PG, for leading, supervising, and inspiring us. I take this occurrence to thank the entire organizing team, Dr. Santoshi Mishra, Ms. Japmala, Ms. Saujanya, Ms. Navya, and Ms. Sana for their involvement and willingness they have expressed and finished their respective task, without which the lecture series wouldn't have been successful. Thank you all. Last but not the least, I would like to thank our participants for unwavering attention throughout the lecture series. Attention spans of such lengths are rare. Thank you so much, girls. Now we come to an end of seven day national level lecture series on igniting young minds towards research. I request everyone to rise for national anthem. Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravida, Uttkala, Vanga, Vindya, Himachal, Yamuna, Ganga, Uchala, Jaladhi, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Name, Jage, Tava, Shubha, Aashish, Maage, Gahe, Tava, Jaya, Gatha, जनगण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू मैम Thank you, ma'am. Girls, the feedback link will be kept in the post box. Please fill the form and submit. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. One second. Yes, Navya. Navya, have you clicked pictures, Navya? Oh. Yes, ma'am. Girls, uh, kindly fill the feedback form for today. It will be posted by Navya Ma'am in the chat box. I request all of you to please uh, fill the feedback link and then you can leave the meeting. Thank you.
Santoshi ma? Yes ma. Unmute ma. Ma wants to say something. Prot Santoshi, you muted me for the throughout uh, seminar. Ma'am, I made you co-host in the beginning. No, no yeah. Santoshi. I was unable to unmute. I was, I, I was thinking, why is ma'am not talking? I made you the co-host, ma'am, in the beginning only. When you joined in the beginning. Yeah, so I was... Uh, Did you join again, ma'am? No, no, no. In between, power uh, went off. And then I joined in my phone. Okay. You should have called me, ma'am. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, Navya, can you take um, a few pictures of this uh, chat also, what ma'am has written? This chat box. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Saujanya, you got the feedback, Saujanya, uh, this regarding Loyola College feedback. Saujanya. Santoshi, you have to unmute. Unmute. Uh, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I've got few, but exact number of uh, how many students have filled in the feedback form, I'll text you, ma'am. I'll check it again. How many number I've got? I'll From Loyola College and St. Francis College also you got? Huh? Yes, ma'am. But uh, exact number I'll tell you, ma'am. I'll see, check it and tell you, ma'am. Oh. How many students are filled in from each college? Oh. Ma'am, the session is still live. Saujinya, uh, Japmala, what all points you'd like to discuss during Criteria 2 meeting? You message me. Uh... Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. 